This is the day that the Lord has made, and we certainly rejoice and are glad in it. I am grateful to God for the gift of this day, and I'm... Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will certainly rejoice and be glad in it. I am grateful to the God who gives us this day, and I am so extremely appreciative of the invitation and the opportunity to share with my United Methodist family in these Bible studies in this season. If I could take a point of privilege, my roots with United Methodism go way back. I grew up in the Simpson United Methodist Church in Wheeling, West Virginia. My father was the lay leader of our local congregation. My mother was the lay speaker for the state of West Virginia. As my own journey and course took me in other directions, I can remember Dick Solon now, one of my professors and a dear friend and brother, uh, trying to guide me back to United Methodism. And I told him I could never really leave because all of my formative factors and influence in my early upbringing were shaped by that Simpson United Methodist Church. And I remember uh, categories such as central jurisdiction and then when we were yoked with um, another church. And I was grateful even as the dean of the School of Theology of Virginia Union University to seek relationship with the United Methodist Church and have the school listed by the University Senate as a center for the preparation of United Methodist pastors and the countless numbers of pastors in this annual conference that I've had the privilege of sitting with in learning context. And I am extremely grateful for this moment. To our esteemed bishop, I thank her for uh, uh, extending uh, this opportunity. And I want to thank each and every one of you for having the courage to address the theme that you are addressing. As you consider that 17th chapter of John and the 20th through the 23rd verses, where Jesus makes what some people have called an unanswered prayer, a prayer that we might be one. And uh, the intention and the commitment to explore the whole issue of unity and oneness in a time when there is so much division in this nation, in the world, and even, may I say, in the midst of the body of Christ. I'm grateful this annual conference has the courage, the discernment, and the will to talk about oneness and unity in a season of division. Bioethicists have said in times past that in a polluted environment, in order to survive, life forms adapt downward. That is, when you analyze life forms, the context and the environmental conditions uh, created by the context engender uh, an expression within the life form that adapts downward according to the pollution. And division has become so normative for the character of our life together that I fear that sometimes even in the church we let the pollution of division dictate the character of our relationships in the body of Christ. This is not to say there will not be sometimes stark and significant divisions, not divisions, but differences. And it's clearly not to say that oneness does away with diversity. But the real question is, how do you live with division with uh, difference and diversity without ceding authority to the powers of division where God's children can no longer walk together and not get weary. 
So I thank you for taking on this task. Now I want to acknowledge at the outset that I am not a biblical scholar. In practice and profession, I teach theology. As a local pastor, theology is a significant part of even how I preach and teach. In a very real sense, I will not get into the nuances of Johannine literature nor uh, linguistic analysis. I have uh, spent time going through numerous commentary talking about this and all of the diverse interpretations of this unity and oneness and you even encounter those who saying it's not talking about oneness among each other but wholeness and completeness in each of us as individuals that we want to be one we want to be whole but I want to suggest that as I just search for meaning in this text, that there is a clear suggestion and powerful prayer that calls us to a sense of unity and oneness in a fashion that does not embrace the normative categories of this world that are always inviting us to divide. Throughout the revelation of God, God in creation, the God revealed in Jesus Christ, that God creates with a sense of oneness and unity. Jesus exists and ministers to restore and to reconcile the fragmentations that have occurred. And the fundamental, essential, and basic identity and mission of the church calls us to a ministry of the restoration that enables us to transcend the barriers of brokenness and create a new community that in a very real sense functions as an agent of a new heaven and a new earth, characterized by authentic communion and calling us back to the design of creation. From creation to consummation, the very movement, the very character, the very design, the very intent of God is into this unity or that we might be one. This is not some oneness that is a form of conformity through allegiance to a code, a framework, or a system. But this is a deeper type of oneness that calls us to the core of our existence and our being. It is oneness of heart, oneness of vision, oneness and unity in purpose. It is relational oneness where there may be all kinds of differences, but the spirit that animates us and the vision that calls us and really orders and directs our steps is one of the unity and oneness evident in every one of God's disclosive activities, this oneness. And at the heart of this matter of oneness, I would suggest is God. Is oneness is affirmed, celebrated, and pursued when God is at the center. Not a doctrine, not a politic, not a culture, and if I even may say this, not even a religion, but God. When God is at the center, the impress of true communion compels and claims us to a way of being that transcends the normativity, normativity of fragmentation, brokenness, 
alienation, division, hierarchy, and affirmation of that which promotes self while engendering violation, objectification, and abuse of somebody else or the rest of creation. I want to suggest that we want to examine this text. This text in John 17 verses 20 through 23 by reflecting on God's design and God's ultimate intent and our calling to be embodied manifestations of the design, the desire, and the intent. In our first lesson today, we're going to talk about being one, the design, the deviation, and the deliverance. In our lesson on tomorrow, we will talk about being one, the devotion, the diversity, and the destiny. Today, the design, the deviation or distortion, and the deliverance from the distortion. If we were to stop and look, and we begin by examining, just reading the scripture, the chosen scripture that focuses our theme. In John 17, verse 20, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. I ask not only on behalf of these, but up for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, or you, Creator, and I are that they may be one as in me and I am in you. May it also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them so they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now, just for a basic overview, this in a very real sense, when Jesus is saying, I'm not just praying for my immediate disciples, those who are of this nascent circle of believers who have come to know me on a deeper level. You can go back to verse 11, and in verse 11, he says, he indicates that now I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, that they may, may be one as you and I are one. But the oneness is now extended, God, this circle's gonna grow. And may the unity and the oneness manifest in this circle, be experienced, expressed, fulfilled, and embodied in the growing sake circle of people who will grow from this moment to be the company of those who follow me. God, and just like you and I are one, may they, may they be one. May they give witness to the fundamental foundational 
communal, relational character I have ordained for my creation. May they model it. Because God, if they can't model it, if they can't give us something other than what pervades the fallen reality, how can people really believe that I've come with a salvific message or word? Because it seems like those who follow you just repeat, practice, and invest in the same sort of distortion that existed before I came. God, how can people really believe that you're not a God of the brokenness, that you're not a God of death and destruction, a God of life, empowerment, and love, and that I am the embodied manifestation of your being in the world. If the people who say they follow me follow the dictates and patterns and embrace the frameworks and constructs of the world rather than provide an incarnate manifestation of the fulfillment of the promise and the possibility. God, my prayer for them is that they will be so authentic in their communion with me that how they live together will manifest the level of intimacy and integrity in our relationship. And as they are one with me, they are one with you as you and I are one. And that people will know who I am and who you are by the way they are and who they are. I pray that they might be one. Let's look for a moment. And I want to suggest that in the beginning, in the beginning, we see four levels are of oneness in God's creative act and nature that affirm the unity that God desires. First of all, there is oneness with God. Notice that the relational uh, symbols are characterized by the word with. God is with us. We were with God. And there's the coordinating conjunction and. There's a fundamental connectivity in all creation with the and and the with. There's a fundamental connection with all the rest of creation and with the creatures in creation and with our authentic and true selves. So we see four levels of oneness that are characteristic of the unity that Jesus is praying for. We're one with God. We're in harmony with ourselves. We're not estranged from our own beings. We're not fragmented and alienated from the essence and the goodness of what it means to be human. That humanity is embraced as a manifestation of God's giftedness and God's goodness. And we celebrate the connection in our total beings. Body and spirit are con connected. We are whole. Huh? formed by God in our physical manifestation, breathed upon by God such that the physical comes to life and the body and the spirit come together and we're whole and we're naked and not ashamed. In our creation, we're made for mutuality, reciprocity, that we're connected in this thing. In fact, we are, it's made clear to us that we are incomplete. We are less than fully 
efficient in our essence when we operate in isolation. It's not good that you be alone, male and female. And one of the things I suggest, the whole idea that then the two shall become one, we have reduced that to only talk about marriage when that may very well be the holistic paradigm for how we walk together, that you and I walk in oneness. And not only do I function in communion with other human beings such that it's not good for me to be in isolation and in separation, I'm made for relation that relation to extends to all creation. So there are four levels of unity and oneness that Jesus is really praying us back into. One with God, one with our true selves, one with our neighbor, and one with creation. It's easy to understand then how Jesus would say all of the truth, all of the law hangs on these three things. Love God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I always add the fourth. You can't love God, love neighbor, and love self without recognizing and honoring how creation is also a manifestation of the character of God. And my relationship with creation is a function of my authentic communion with God. So we see these four levels, these four levels of oneness, four levels that invite us to authentic communion with God. Now, this is the design of God. It's the intent of God. This is God's handiwork and essential and fundamental to the very nature of the handiwork is unity and oneness. And violation and breaking of any of the dimension of the oneness creates in injury or on this day you will surely die. On this day, what your word there is, you will be separated. You will be pulled apart. And the pulling apart of God's connectivity leads to death, decline, and decay of the human community of the earth, of our understandings of the possibilities and the possibilities resident and the promise resident in our, the gift of humanity and the agency of our humanity. And it pulls us apart from the full intimacy and recognition of God. Let me say this right now. Oneness like perfection is never possessed. It is always pursued. Because there is a relational dimension to the oneness, relation can never be a static uh, concept or category where I possess it. I'm always living into this. That's why uh, my students will always hear me teach that the greatest way not to ever know God is to know God too well already. Such that you think you know God so well, you've already codified, reified, and doctrinized God to the degree that God can't get a word edgewise because you're worshiping what you know about God rather than living as a seeker, constantly moving into relationship with God. And that's why this whole issue of forgiveness is fundamental to our unity and our oneness because I recognize in every moment of my existence and in every day of my living, there are moments where in my expression, my thought, my affirmations, and in my modalities, I have not fully honored the standard of oneness ordained by God in creation in Christ, the Holy Spirit, and in coming consummation. Did you hear what I said? 
We just set the kind of the standard for our understanding of oneness. What is the character of the creation? What is the character of the revelation of Christ? What is the function and the nature of the charisma or the work of the Holy Spirit? And what is the goal, vision, intent, and desire of consummation? So when I examine what oneness is and the standard for assessing my full participation in oneness, does it violate the oneness communicated in creation? Does it violate the oneness incarnated in Jesus Christ? Does it violate the oneness uh, affirmed, birthed, and celebrated by Pentecost, by the Holy Spirit. Does the spirit, does the charisma witness to this oneness that I embrace? And does it manifest the fullness of God's desire for the ultimate fulfillment of all creation and the consummation? Those are my four principles of looking at oneness, creation, Christ, charisma, and consummation. This sets a standard of how we live into it. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray. He's really praying, God, uh, forgive me this day where I have embraced principles and categories of separation and I have not related function and moved in a manner where I have been an agency of the manifestation and the restoration of the communion and the oneness that you desire in creation. As we begin to assess our, our time and where we are, let us move further. Further by looking at this. Being one, we see the design. Then we talk about, look at the distortion, the fragmentation, and the separation enters the world. The distortion is produced by the acceptance of two lies told by the symbol that represents that demonic aspect of a free moral universe which invites your participation in thought, a desire, or behavior in that which is alien to God's intent, desire, and decree for our lives together. Look, there's an element that says, tells two lies that engender the process of fracturing the human community. First of all, God is above you, is threatened by you, and does not want you empowered and fully knowledgeable. God wants you in a deficient state, and the God you serve is a God over you, which violates the self-revelation of God as the God who is with you. Then the other lie is that you are not much that you don't have intrinsic worth and dignity characterized by your existence in the image of God. But in order to have value, you must go outside of yourself and get something outside of yourself, living rather than releasing and li uh, living um, on the amazing gift and the presence of God in yourself. So now you go outside to get something and to getting something makes you somebody. Do we understand, family, that in a very real sense, we're now in a moment where we don't live by affirming and releasing the life and being fruitful participants in life-giving context in a family. We now succumb to a lie and start living and assigning our value and worth by what we get. Now, look at this. And look at how this affects and informs the whole principle of unity and oneness. Let me, let me get up. You know, I want to go to the, the, the classroom, if I might, and begin to look and begin to think about the two lies. In the beginning, where is God? God is at the center of it all. In the lie, then with and coordinated by the and, the categories are above 
and below. See that family? Now our consciousness is no longer centered in God where the categories of existence are with and and. We have now established a theological framework where God is above and we are below. Now look what happens when you start believing the lie. Lie, you're no good. And in order to get above, God is here, wants you here, and I am now the one who's going to show you how you can get above too. So therefore, the goal in your life is to get above. And in getting above, you become comfortable with somebody else being below. And getting above now becomes godly behavior rather than demonic embrace. Are you with me, family? Can you see? Look, look at the shift that's occurring. Relationship is broken. You have now entered into death or separation because the way you are now functioning is above and below rather than with and and. I'm no longer and you and me and with you and me. I am no longer with God, with you, with my true self and with uh, nature. I am above nature. My, I am divided in my body and I have an above and below dimension, one physical, one spiritual, and the church perpetuates this. And then you are no longer the neighbor, you are the threat. And we who celebrated each other now war with each other. And you even introduce in your relational modality in a post fall existence, somebody who is appropriately subject to somebody else. You are introduced in the fall because of your embrace of this to somebody who is above and somebody below. And now because of this, somebody has to be subject. Somebody is defined as deficient. So this whole system begins to permeate the reality and it permeates our consciousness to the degree that what is in fact the deviation from God's design becomes normative for our behavior, even our theology. And some of you know, and all of you have been in my class, there's a term I use for this, that we shift from theology to snakeology and start constructing our world based upon the design of the snake rather than God. Do you understand this? So now we get into deviation. And the deviation leads to hierarchical valuation where there is above and a below. And we even begin to construct the world based upon the above and below paradigm. Now, if we could say this for a moment and look at this. So then we get God. And for many people, there's even a hierarchy in the Trinity. Then you get Christ. Then you get the Holy Spirit. And depending on your tr tradition, then you have something else, something else, something else, something else. And then you go through these ranks of authority. Then you get the human. And then you start uh, hierarchicalizing and creating gradations of humanity. In the history of this country, you have male, female, come on, children, and these children are understood as having value based upon their race, then you, then, or culture, then you get what? After that, then you get black men, black women, black children, apes, orangutans, dogs, cats, and you have a hierarchy with a chain of being, and you live by trying to move up the chain. And so in the very real sense, you set up a system where somebody else being beneath you gives you a sense of value in your location, and you live by moving up rather than living with. And regrettably, 
Sometimes even in church leadership, I want to move up so that I can be over. Rather, I am faithful to the degree that I want to be more fully with. That the manifestation and the evidence of our maturation in our faith is our embrace of authenticity and unity. Now, as our time flies, let me just introduce then, how do we get out of this? What is the alteration? Here is a system developed based upon an above and below, based upon an a in and an out, based upon power systems and engendering separation. Now let me see and make this very, very clear. In the system, domination is divinized, stratification is sacralized, and a hierarchy is spiritualized. Now look, here is the system. It's constructed. It's constructed, and here is the design of God. And we're suggesting that in every one of God's self-disclosive activity, you can see the design. Here's the design. The design is relational. The design is integrated. The design is mutual. There is a spirit in the world that introduces a shift away from unity and oneness to separation, hierarchy, and devaluation, and the establishment of value based upon where you are in the hierarchy in creation rather than your relation in creation. You get separated from your body, and then even our Western spirituality is infrated with an anti-somatic body-negating syndrome, a, a, a somophobia, which is a correlate of our homophobia that we actually believe the body is something to be repressed and negated. We reduce the value, the dignity and worth and the gift of, uh, of authentic and humanity. We separate from our bodies and even in the church, the spirit becomes the good part. The body becomes the bad part. And Jesus' question again is, wilt thou be made whole? Wilt you bring together? Because the bottom line is when we are embracing the categories of separation and the fragmentation of our unity and oneness, we don't bring the body and the spirit back together. We move one domain where the body is superior and then we go to church and say, no, say the spirit is superior. But if you look at that, we have not altered the hierarchy. All that we've done is shifted perspectives in the hierarchy so that even after I come to the church, Church. I'm just as broken in the church as I was in the world. And the consequence of this is I never experienced the wholeness. I'm at war rather than at peace. So share this now. And so all of these events begin to occur. They begin to shape our consciousness and it's deeply embedded. And we don't want to get out of the brokenness. We build monuments to our brokenness. We enshrine our brokenness. We codify and establish policy to affirm and ensure our brokenness. And we continue to preach a broken theology that affirms a broken community where somebody is always the deficient and I am the superior and what I look for in truth is not the healing of the brokenness, but the maintenance of my privilege and my power in the brokenness. It's often said that, in a, that once you obtain privilege from oppression, you don't want truth. You want a lie, which you call truth, that preserves your privilege. So here's the danger of this separation and then the separation being uh, the foundation for a hierarchical relation or non-relation. 
Once I start living like this, then truth is that which preserves my position, my power, and my status in the hierarchical system. And I even grow you to move up in the system rather than to be an agent that is challenging and transforming our system such that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And we often miss this because sometimes in liberation struggles, this guess what? I was, I'm last and now guess what I'm going to do? No, all you've done is replicated the model that victimized you. The last becoming first and the first becoming last is not an inversion of the hierarchy. It's the collapsing of the hierarchy to the degree there is no last or first. We are a whole people. I don't see you as last and first. I see you as presence and person and I assign value to you. And anytime I see a system or a structure that denies the intrinsic worth, dignity and value of your person, then I have to be a, an agent of healing and restoration that calls us back to the communion and the unity and the oneness that God desires. And how does God do this? What is the message of God in bringing this to our attention? This is the great gift of Christ. The one who is one with God models oneness in creation and invites us back to oneness with each other. See, in the beginning, God presents God's self. Boom. And what do we see? We see God fully manifest in creating communion, unity, harmony, and relationship. Then there is that presence in God's presentation that misrepresents misrepresents the nature of God and creation through what lies two lies about God and you notice this now you believe the lie and that those living by those lies be believe bring death and destruction to the world God God is still invested in creation Invested to the degree that God is continually, constantly giving God's self to restore what God desires in creation. This is the great gift of Jesus. It's God, what? Re-pre-presenting God's self. God, God presented, was misrepresented. Now God represents God's self. And Jesus represents God. See? And in representing God, he is no longer the God who is the lie that is over you. Who is he? Emmanuel. Come on. God who is with you. And what is the call of the church? What is the call of the church? That as Jesus represents God, we are called to represent now. And here's my prayer and also my agony. In this nation, in clear and ways, the church has not represented God and represented God. It is affirmed, embraced, condoned, and supported the separation. But thanks be to God that the stuff of misrepresentation has not stopped God from being manifest in creation. Well, family, let's stop here today. Now, now look, today being one, the design, you saw that. The distortion, you saw that. And the deliverance, the deliverance. In God representing God's self, represented and represented in Christ that invites us to represent. On tomorrow, we will consider, again, our devotion 
to this model and our recognition and celebration of diversity as we pursue a different destiny. God bless you. Good morning, family and friends and fellowship of believers who are seeking to fulfill God's design and desire for creation in the human community. We thank the God who again blesses us with this day and with this moment. And again, we acknowledge our, our bishop and her very courageous and creative leadership that she provides to not only the United Methodist Church, but to this region, this community, and dare I say, even the nation <clears throat> and the world. On yesterday, as we reflect for a moment on where we began, we looked at being one, the design, the deviation, and the gift of deliverance in Christ Jesus. We enumerated four self-revelatory acts of God that reveal God's call to oneness, creation, Christ, charisma, and consummation. Then we shared for a while about how the whole narrative is revelatory of dimensions that want to distort and create deviation from the design primarily through deception or lies. And the lies are told that cause you to miss the majesty of God and the majesty of your creation. And then as a consequence, you enter into death or a state of separation. And the separation is from God, from your true self, from your neighbor, and from the rest of creation. But thanks be to God. Uh, I'll be preaching a sermon shortly entitled, The Blessing in the Block. When Jesus, uh, when, when in the very beginning, God put Adam and Eve out of the garden and put an angel with flaming swords to prevent them from eating that which would give them eternal life. <clears throat> that there was a blessing in the block because that action was not God putting out or putting away, but it was God putting forth an opportunity so that the negatives that had been in, incurred would not be eternalized. That is, the block was actually an act of grace and mercy, that I love you so much that I will not internalize your separated condition. In order to overcome separation, I must function in a fashion that does not allow you to perpetually eternalize separation. So I block you from that, not to put you really out, but to call you forward and make an opportunity for a new heaven and a new earth. And God did that. God did that, and that was in the gift of the deliverance in the deviation. This is the amazing gift of the Christ. If you will permit me, as you all see, I try to do everything I do from memory and what I've internalized with a level of authenticity and spontaneity. That's why I miss you all. I wish we could be in a situation where you could raise your hand or you could say, now, wait a minute, what about this or that? And we could really, in communion, communicate where we may different, have differences or a voice that may help clarify, but we would never embrace the spirit of division. Let me read from my own preparations and writings to go back to the deviation. Succumbing to the lie, we are distanced from the God who is with us and hide from a God who is beyond us and over us. We are now separated from our true selves and we're ashamed of the bodies that once glorified God. 
We are now in conflict and competing for place and stuff who, with those who were once our partners and viewed as gifts from the Creator. We now struggle with nature and destroy the garden. We may now play power games of coercion, manipulation, and control by modeling the O over God. We now repress our bodies, compete with neighbor, and war with nature. One no longer lives by releasing life, but our, we function by controlling and getting something outside of ourselves. Rather than being fruitful relational create creatures, we become using, abusing, and fruitless. We don't produce fruit. Life, we take it. And the story is trying to tell us of a shift from the relational paradigm to a competitive positional paradigm where we don't, we, and you are valued by what you take, not by what you give and produce from your center. We enter into this state of separation, embracing the fall, as normal to for our understanding of God, we are thrust in a dualistic modality. In this condition, God is over and distant from creation while always demanding and coercing and taking something from us. As creatures, we are insecure, threatened underlings who try to protect ourselves by being like the distant taking God in taking something in order to be somebody, we move up in place and power in the hierarchy. The giving and the fruitful God, the sacred self, are lost in a maze of positions, possessions, and power plays. And the abundant experience of presence and person is missed. We are reduced to monads who relate to the creator and each other for utilitarian purposes. The quality and care of our relationships with each other and the rest of creation are not essential to faithfulness. The other God and the earth are separated. A line of demarcation is established between the sacred and the profane and faithlessfulness is disembodied, immaterial and transhistorical. And tragically, much of the teaching, discourse, and behavior of the church embraces the hierarchy, the objectification, and the status assigning based upon persons' positions in the hierarchy rather than the celebration and encounter of intrinsic worth and dignity. The church's culpability in this, if I may say this, is even sometimes affirmed, as I have written in another context, the culpability in the development and the maintenance of fractured community is further manifest in that some Christians still invite others to join the church to be better than some other person or religion. Some still teach that Christians are better than some other folk. We miss the Christ and the center of Christianity when the church becomes the place we serve a need to be better than. Christianity does not offer an opportunity for someone to be in the highest religion and the goal of our faith is not to get the highest office or to, to be in the highest religion. In Christ, we don't live to be above. We live to be with. We live to be authentic and whole. What we suggested on yesterday is that while the powers of deviation can be manifest and expressed in the world and have authority in the world, these powers don't have authority in the body of Christ. 
that our centering in God is a call and even a compulsion to live in an alternative counter world fashion that we don't participate in agents in the division and uh, the assigning of value purely based upon politics, positions, possessions, and whether or not you belong to my group. In this vision, there's a fundamental, profound, and deep recognition of the intrinsic worth and dignity of everybody I encounter, particularly in the church, but when I understand the full, mature consciousness of the character of this God revealed in Jesus Christ, I recognize that no human being on the face of this earth can be viewed without seeing God, without interpreting with God eyes. And with those God eyes, I have to begin to invest in behaviors, <clears throat> in thinking, in policies and practices that honors the gift of God in all humanity. As we consider this and see how Jesus overcomes, if you stop and look at Jesus, everywhere that there is fragmentation, Jesus heals it. Look, the God who was there and you were down here. And the tragic consequence of the over God, you then develop systems that allow you to say that being godly is being over and somebody else down. Think about that for a moment. And many of us will not surrender the over God because we would have to surrender our over consciousness and constructs where we're always over something and beneath. Jesus said this in 25th chapter of Matthew when he said, what you did unto the least of these you did unto me. And the real challenge that I think it makes to us is not that we affirm ourselves for our charity. The challenge is, why do you treat people like they're the least? When you see them, you never see the least, you see me. And until you see me in everybody, they will be the least, and the fact that you're doing something for them makes you the more. When you see them as me, Every moment with them is not a moment with the least. It's a moment with me, and it's not your claim to fame. It's your recognition of their value and my truth. So in this sense, in the Christ, we see the affirmation, first of all, God is with you. I've been pastoring where I pastor for a long time, and so I have some pulpit liberties that some of you might not have. I get to go crazy sometimes. So a couple years ago, I preached a sermon entitled, Go to Hell. And I talked about the fact that how, how sometimes um, we always want to go to heaven, but it may be that what makes you fit for heaven is your willingness to go to hell. When you can't go to hell for somebody else, you're really not fit for heaven because God entered your hell and went to hell for you when you love that God enough to go to hell. Could we be identified as a church that's willing and committed to going to hell? Even if we don't move and do some things, we locate ourselves in the midst of the hell and we become the life-giving presences. Just, just a thought. But then one of the things that I pointed out is that too many of us serve a high up God and the sermon that followed that was, I serve a low down God. That I serve a low down God. My God is so low down that if you make your bed in hell, God will meet you there. What he's really saying is that God gives God's self to the situations and where we want to make God up there, God is the God who is with. And God is so low down, he'll meet you 
when you make your bed in hell. I'm so glad that I serve a low down God. A God who is not up there, but the God revealed in Jesus Christ who is with me in every situation and circumstance. Even when I am not committed to the relationship, God is. And Jesus invites us. Will you commit? Will you become one as I am with the creator, as I am with you? And can my people be one as I am with the creator? See, Jesus, first of all, reveals a God who's with us. Then I think what this is my own approach now, family. So look, look that Jesus literally <clears throat> affirms humanity. Jesus came through the precious gift of a woman. In other words, the way Jesus came into the world was an affirmation of the birth process and affirms God's presence in birth. And could it be, and we're not here to discuss Christology, that his birth is as much about getting God back into humanity as much as the tradition that's been developed that he was born this way to get humanity out of Jesus. Could this be God's profound statement that I am in humanity? Humanity is the product of my work and my doing that he restores humanity. The whole birth story restores nature as the stars and the heavens participate in the revelation. It's amazing where all the area, uh, dimensions of disconnect are transcended, both by the narrative, just like there's a narrative of the fall, there's a new creation narrative where all the dimensions of the fragmentation are transcended by the revelation of God's love and presence in Jesus Christ, and now we're invited. Will we be agents of the revelation of the healing and restoration rather than the brokenness? This is what Jesus does. But here's one of the things that I think that is one of the great tragedies that is now manifest. With all of the division that we've had, <clears throat> increasingly there's a focus on oneness that requires the trivialization and negation of diversity. Oneness and sameness are antithetical. You can't be one when you are the same. Oneness affirms diversity. Oneness affirms that within the amazing aspects of creation, you will have diversity in expression and story. The reality is there's nothing wrong with diverse manifestations and interpretations of the Christian story. The problem is not the diversity, the division. And as long as life is lived authentically, there will always be diversity. Stop and look at it. No two zebras or tigers have the exact same stripes. No two leopards have the exact same spots. Do you realize I was amazed that they can identify whales by the nature of their flukes? There's some species they can identify by their fins that there is going to be some diversity in creation. There are those who argue that no two flowers have the exact same color or the exact same scent. There's nothing in creation that is same. No two snowflakes have the exact same design. No two leaves have the exact same uh, uh, vein pattern. None of us have the exact same retinal rod configuration. None of us have the exact same fingerprints or the exact same DNA markers. In a very real sense, each and every one of us is a unique instance of dis, uh, uh, divine dexterity and God's creative power. So when I see you, I have to see your diversity, and your diversity is not a threat to the communion of the oneness 
oneness. It is the material of oneness. The reality is that in order to have a relationship, there is going to be diversity in who we are, our perspectives, but we remain one because our diversity does not allow us to establish deficiency and difference to the degree that it engenders division. Are you with me, family? That is, I'm not you. I tell the story all the time. One of my sons, my wife and I are blessed to have seven children. Six of them are, are young men. Uh, uh, we have three birth children, but we, we, we welcome four young men into our family. And there are, you know, we don't, we don't make distinctions. They're, they're sons, all of that. I got 22 grandchildren. That's because all of their children are my children. Anytime they get married with a blended family, they all become Mine, great train grandchildren, that we're family. But in this family, there is such amazing diversity. But I got one son who swears he's a lover. I keep teasing him. It's time for him to outgrow that. Uh, 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 but, uh, you know, he always has a, he has, you know, his, his line. And I've shared this often, you know, where he, I've heard him say to somebody, wow, you know, I was just looking at you. And, you know, he tries he tries to, to master kind of sp a kind of a spiritual language, you know. Uh, you're an outstanding example of feminine pulpitude that gives ample evidence that I serve a God who does all things well. And he's always talking about, you know, you're one in a million. Oh, you're one in a million. I said, do you realize how much of an insult that is? Do you realize that she's not one in a million? If you say she's one in a million, hmm, there are over 300 million people in the United States of America. Let's just use the figure. It's, it, that, that's, that's a dynamic number. And we talk about well, 350 million. So guess what? If we divide that evenly, there's 175 million, 175 million men, 175 million women. Just, I'm, I'm, we're just speaking imagistically now, not factually then that means that there are 175 persons just like her. So if you don't work out as 174 others, no. When we encounter each other, we encounter a unique instance. And every one of us has the fingerprint of God on us. And I would say regardless of your race, your religion, regardless of your status, if I affirm that there is one God, there is one creator, everyone has the fingerprints of God on them. And if I begin to identify them by some other condition or status other than the fact that I see God, I meet you and I meet you, God, I'm missing them. And if I tutor them to miss the dignity of their God creation, that no matter what they see, the fingerprints of God on them, and if they can look in the mirror and see something that is not of God, you're not looking at God's imprint. You're looking at smudges left by hands that shouldn't have been on you in the first place. I have these grandchildren, and they try to keep Papa, this senior citizen, seasoned citizen. Uh, they try to keep me current. So every now and then I have to develop little raps for them to help them understand what I'm saying, to begin to understand the gift of God in the human that Jesus came to affirm. He did not come to affirm your deficiency. He reveals the gift of your humanity and your authenticity. And it's this, your situation and your location and somebody else's interpretation that leads to your negation is not the basis of your identification because your identification is in your creation, not your situation, location, in their interpretation that leads to your negation. And once you claim a relation with the source of your creation, there is no situation, location, interpretation, or power of negation that can place a limitation on your elevation and your destination. That this root in relation, and once I claim this relation with God, with self, I live for relationship with you, even though I may differ with you radically. I may even have to confront you and engage you. Yes, I will challenge racism, sexism, homophobia. I will challenge any form that diminishes people and objectifies them with a code so that I can't see and affirm how God is in the midst of them. 
But at the same time, even the person I differ from, I encounter you as a gift of God. And there may be some flaws, there may be this, but I see with the eyes of God. And so in this sense, the diversity does not destroy us. The diversity is the evidence of our God creation. The diversity is the very statement of God that all of this in its diversity is me. And when I meet me. So one of the ways I try to illustrate this, uh, one of the things that amazes me, you all know I'm old school. In a lot of ways, I'm, I'm, I'm cons conservative, as radical as I am on some things. Um, uh, I'm sometimes amazed at the public displays of affection. I realize, you know, when I was in school, you weren't allowed to even uh, hug up or anything. And now I'll go to ball games to support some of the children and stuff or go to events. And they'd hug up anything, all kind. There were no PDA, no PDA. But I can remember dating a young lady and holding her hand. And what amazed me was um, I learned uh, the great uh, power in a touch. See, our hands would touch. And you just didn't hold it. You know, you would all rub in the fingers and, and look into each other's eyes. And oh, but as I reflect upon those moments, our hands were experience the empirical tactile sensation of the encounter, but my entire body and being participated in the moment. Our hands were touching, but my toes curled up in my shoes. Knees got weak and chills went up and down my spine. It helped me to understand ever more fully that the eye doesn't say to the ear and say you're not an ear or the, f the foot doesn't say to the hand. Why? Because I don't want the eye to do the eye thing because there are certain things that the entire body experiences because of the freedom and authentic expression within the different parts of the body. The foot doesn't say hand, don't be a hand, be a foot. We're all feet here, we're all this. No, the hand, the foot says wow. I can't do what you do, and I've never had that experience, but my God, when you share your touch with me, my toes enter the moment. Hallelujah. My back enters the moment. That yes, I don't want to deny the diversity because the diversity is when we begin to really value the meaning of what it means to be a whole body. So this is diverse. In this devotion to God, where God is not at the top, but at the center. I remember even moving into ministry. I had a whole preacher who says, now you got to understand, God is first. Your children and family come second. Your church comes third. And then he even said, you come way down here. Mm -mm. God does not create a hierarchy of value. And I hope that we will do away with that type of concept and categorization in the way that we even guide people into effective ministry. God is never at the top. God is at the center. And God is at the center of everything I do. God should be the guide and should be ordering your steps in every relationship and the practice. I'll never forget how this became clear to me as a dean several years ago as a young man came beating on my door before I was going in to teach my class and my students said, no, don't bother Dr. Kenny before class because he's, he goes into preparation that's not just about what I've prepared in the lecture, but how am I uh, in tune with the Spirit in God, that I'm the agent of God's presence when I step into the classroom. How do I create sacred space in the learning process? And, and uh, beating on my door, saying, Dean, Dean, I gotta talk to you, gotta talk to you. I said, okay, come on, what's wrong? I just want you to know, uh, me and my wife, we're through. 
We're through. We're through. We're through. It's over. It's done. She left this weekend and we're done. And I said, well, come on in. What happened? What happened? She said, Dean, I was, she, she came. His wife was, um, uh, was away a lot. She had a job that required her to travel. But she came home for periods. And she said, you know, my wife has been away. She was home this weekend. And uh, 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 I was working on my stuff. And uh, she said to me, came in and said, you know, even when I'm here, you're not. And I said, well, well, how did you respond to her? I had to remind her. I took his Bible and said, I had to remind her, God comes first and she comes second. And I said, what did she say? She said, you and your God go to hell. Dean, you don't know I don't need a woman like that. I need a woman who will support me and work with me in this ministry. God is first in my life. And I said, maybe you didn't hear what she said. She said, you and you go to hell. Because the way you acknowledged her express need was to say to her, the only needs that matter in this house are mine. She came to you saying, I need you. And what you told her is what you need doesn't matter. It's what I need. He said, well, what, what, what could I have said? What did you expect me to say? I said, you could have said to her, I hear you and I feel you. And I know I've been very distracted. But God is the center of my life. But sweetheart, since God is the center of my life, you will never have to be second to anything because I want to love you the way God wants you loved. Did you all hear just what I said? God is not here and then you, with God in your life you use God as justification for devaluation, neglect and denial of certain groups, certain people. God is at the center and with God at the center that center mediates motivates and directs everything I do. I want to love my children like God wants them loved. My wife like God wants them. I want to love and function in the church like God wants me to function. So there is no first, second, or ranking in my ministry because God is at the center and sets the standard for everything we do. Diversity the appreciation for all of the dynamic ways in which God has created this. And how do we celebrate, make space, make room, honor and respect the diversity rather than trivialize the diversity by creating a universalization of sameness, which really often is an exercise by the power group to determine what the same will look like. And anybody who doesn't fit the same will be excluded, denied, repressed, and victimized. What does diversity look like? And how do we live in oneness in the diversity, even when some story is not our story, this is the place that we can begin to hear, understand, engage, and embrace the stories, diverse as they may be. Well, family, there's so much that we could talk about in this domain of diversity, but we see the deliverance and our devotion to God. Remember now today, being one devotion, God at the center. And then the devotion celebrates and causes me to recognize within creation, within everything God has done, one of the marks of God's creation is diversity. Did you ever stop and think why you have diverse gospels? Because each writer, each person who experienced it, 
came through the axis, the interpretive framework, through the narrative and the story of their experience. And the fullness of the truth is not in the negation of a story, but the meeting of the stories. And I don't function to destroy the story, but to create space where I can hear you, see you, and begin to celebrate the marvelous of acts of God in and through you. And together, we are one body. Together, we pr answer the prayer of Jesus. God, you prayed that we would be one. Well, God, there's a lot of brokenness around us. But in spite of our titles and designations, here, we affirm you, you, in all of us. Here, we wrestle how to live with the diversity without devaluing and creating deficiency that requires us to live in division. We are one in you, in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, and our vision for the fulfillment of creation. We are one. We are one. You see, there's a way that I try to present this. Let, let me get up one minute, family. Just too often in the dysfunction and the deviation, here's how we construct the concept. Let's make this saying, the words in the beginning, and the two shall be one. Guess how we decided? Instead of embracing the fundamental and profound spiritual truth, one plus one equals one. So rather than spiritually solving the equation, we worldly and with the consciousness of the world solver, well, if we're going to be one, somebody's got to be what? A zero. And I don't know if uh, uh, Don Pizak is, is listening to me right now. <laughs> and I'm trying to remember my other dear brothers when my student would teach you. And they even showed me a mathematical formula where you could add one and one and get one by using some uh, e equations and by relating it to infinity plus infinity equals infinity. Now look, one plus zero, and guess what? That's the way the world functions. That is, in order for me to be in relationship, I've got to make you nobody. And you've got to become something that serves me or functions on my behalf. You are an objectified monad who must conform to my definition of your being. And the purpose of the definition is for you to serve my understanding and my person and for you to eschew any authenticity. Now, historically, in male-female relationships, a good zero was what? A woman. But you got a female bishop. And there are a lot of folk right now. I'm going to just say it, okay? Can I just say it? There are a lot of folk right now who will still have problems with female leadership. And it was made absolutely clear recently in our history in a number of different ways. So we say, when I relate to you, I immediately begin tutoring you in how to be a zero. And then the minute that you start claiming yourself, the language becomes you're getting out of your place because your place is beneath me that requires the negation of your being. Now, other folk do this. One half plus one half equals one. No, we don't want to re re zeros. We'll both be half of this relationship. But guess what? In spiritual language, this is a broken person with a broken person will always lead not to one, but a broken relationship. Um, in, in premarital counseling, I talk about if you are miserable by yourself, you're going to be miserable with somebody else. 
and you don't relate to fix your brokenness, you relate to share your wholeness. So this is a whole person plus a whole person equals a whole relationship. So when I meet you, not just in marriage, I encounter a whole person. That does not mean you don't have flaws. It does not mean that you don't participate in brokenness, but I embrace your, your identity as an invitation for you to be whole, to be affirmed as a human being who has intrinsic worth and dignity that I encounter that dignity before I encounter any exterior about you and I affirm that dignity. So therefore, I see you. Uh, I want to share with you. Um, this is something that I'm going to share starting in June when we greet each other as a church. We will say, Sabona. Sabona is a term that comes from the Zulu in South Africa, which means we see you. We see you. Now, let me let you share with you what will be on the web page. Sabona is a greeting from the Zulu in the motherland, which means we see you. I see you. This is not just a polite hello but rather an act of recognizing your worth and dignity of each person we encounter. It says, I see the depth and the whole of you, including your past, your mystery, your flow, your flaws, the gift of your presence, and the promise of your future. The greeting indicates that I affirm your being and value your life. Sabona so symbolizes our authentic presence with each other and our willingness to invest in each other and the well-being of our community. We exist together and I see you. I pay attention to you. I believe the best for you and I offer myself for the realization of the best that we can be. Sawabona so calls us beyond seeing the stuff to seeing the soul and moves us beyond labeling and defining by the exteriors to valuing the life. Perceiving beyond the blindness of hierarchical categories of supremacy and self and other negation, we step out of the darkness of division into the light of truth that allows us to see each other more deeply and clearly and commit to being the church, the people of God and the agents of a new heaven and a new earth. So as I prepare to conclude the day, in my moment of sharing with you, Saul Bona, I see you. We see you. At some point I don't see your politics. I don't see the stuff about you. We are one because we see each other. And when you come here, can I say this? When you come to the Virginia Annual Conference, you don't experience a label that has already defined you as deficient, unwanted, and undesirable. I see you. I see you. It's created by a God who has made you mystically wondrously, mysteriously, and yea, even magically. I see you in all of the giftedness of God in you. So before you hear anything about my policy, my position, or my polity, hear this. God loves you, and I do too. Saul Bona, our time won't permit it, but can I just throw this out, family? If we're ultimately going to think about being one, it's going to require us to find a new symbol system for talking about God's fulfillment, the kingdom, the reign of God. Because the more I come to look through the eyes of the God who sees me, 
and to love myself, my neighbor, and God and creation. The more I recognize I can't have a future that glorifies and eternalizes separation and division. If God created us for unity, calls us to oneness, then how can the God, when that God comes to absolute reign, be the God who makes division eternal? God, my God, at the center. May we be one. Salvona, we see you. I see you. We see you. I see you. And with every prophetic radical stance that we take against anything, and I've articulated multiple times where I stand on a number of things that divide us in this land, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. May they be one. Sawabona, Sawabona, we see.